Hi guys, welcome back. Uh, this is Matt Chat, episode 376, uh, featuring part three of my interview with Mr. Tim Lang, uh, one of the designers at New World Computing. In this part of the interview, we talk about the uh, designs of the levels on the Might and Magic series, uh, six and seven and eight, and we also talk about nine. Uh, we talk about some uh, tips, or, or Tim gives some tips for how to do uh, good levels and how you can design levels that won't kill your computer. Uh, we also talk about how programmers, artists, and uh, uh, producers uh, should work together properly and what can uh, go wrong when they don't. So, a lot of great stuff here. I think you really, really enjoy it. So, without further ado, here is Mr. Tim Lang. So, I guess at the time, uh, I was trying to put together a little timeline in my head mm -hmm. about the time uh, Wizardry, I mean, yeah, Wizardry, uh, Might and Magic uh, 6 was coming out. Wizardry must have been up to what... Uh, 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 that was Wizardry the... eight. Eight. Okay. It was uh, I think Wizardry eight had come out. Uh, that was the legend. What was the name of that game? Oh, let's see. It's it, it, it. I remember. I can't remember now, but but it was. Uh, it had actually Wizardry eight. I think came out after Might Magic six, because I do remember thinking about. I remember playing it. And and uh, trying to figure out, okay, so when we're working on Might and Magic Nine, what do they do right. good that we we may want to steal or yeah. or you know things like that? And I guess Ultima Underworld had been out for a while. Yeah, then. and I was Daggerfall. Did you play Daggerfall? Daggerfall. Oh, yeah. I I yeah, okay. I'm probably one of the few people who who endured all of the, uh, the <laughs> issues with Daggerfall and actually finished it. Wow. <laughs> um. Yeah, Daggerfall was Daggerfall was before Might and Magic Six, right before. So it, it, I, um, yeah. So because I do remember playing it before. I, well, I remember seeing our little trailers for Might and Magic Nine, going, "Oh, we're gonna we're gonna be better in Daggerfall." <laughs> <laughs> Not quite as expansive, obviously. There's, I don't know if there's a game that's since that's been as big as as Daggerfall was. And all that procedural generated stuff. Yeah. Know. Yeah. And they, you know, they even, even today there's still procedural, uh, like plugins. Like I use the unity engine. So I look at all their little add ons and, and, uh, asset store stuff. And some of them are, are dungeon creators. And, and I think that, that even today with all the modern technology, the, the dungeon creation from, from Daggerfall is still as good as any procedurally generated tool today. Wow. Which is something because that that game was that came out 20, 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah, I had a lot of a lot of fun with that one, but yeah, you could definitely see sometimes the <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I do remember yeah, that when I said when I said uh, I'm going to finish this game when I decided that basically before every game session I had this routine of I I downloaded a uh, save save game fixer that I had to run every time. Wow! And uh, yeah, you're right. You could see it. You could see sometimes you like, uh, and and I think that's probably the same with any good procedural sort of uh, generator. Is that's the same stuff with No Man's Sky, right? Series. They talk about the same sort of criticisms. Yeah. And yeah. How many and, years later, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and that's that's the one thing about uh, I think that that. The guys with No Man's Sky didn't quite realize is when you sure you can create this giant giant world, but then you got to fill it with stuff. <laughs> and and uh, you know I learned that lesson working on on Might and Magic, where a couple levels I was like, oh this level's huge. Now what am I going to put in it? And and you realize very very quickly that that you make the level smaller and more cramped, then you fill it with stuff and it feels you know feels real that was one thing that i when i was doing doing the level design classes for the the level designers on might magic nine mm -hmm. i said small think small don't make these giant things think small and then 
bigger First is off, not necessarily it, it, better, is it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because it's it, it ends up it's easier to control the player and control the gameplay in smaller spaces than it is in larger spaces. Because um, then you've got you know you got larger spaces, players can completely break whatever you you'd had in mind for them at the time. I remember this was you talked a little bit about this with Drew and how mm -hmm. JVC some of that was actually limitations of the of the game engine like uh -huh. you know, if you let them see too far. Yeah, uh, yeah. Would, so, uh, so the the thing about um, game development, uh, especially back in those days with with the early BSP engines and and stuff like that, is is that it will draw the whole world if you let it see the whole world. And, and that'll basically bring the game to its knees. <clears throat> and uh, one thing that, that JVC taught us when we were originally working on Might Magic 9 is like, so if, you know, separate things by, and I still do this today, to separate things with corridors. So if, if, uh, if your wall is too long and you can't, and the, the performance is going, going down, just put a little L-shaped corridor in there and, and you're fixed. <laughs> it's just amazing to me. Just as somebody who plays lots of games and doesn't yeah, know so much and, about that kind of stuff, you know, it explains a lot. That uh... <laughs> yeah, and you see that the one one game that that I did that really well, uh, I think, kind of took it to different levels is is uh, Half Life Two, mm -hmm. where what they would try to do <clears throat> is is hide level loads in those same sorts of spaces. So if you ever if you go through go back through Half Life Two again, you'll see. You know you'll you'll walk into basically like a tunnel, and then the game stops, and then you load the next level, and then you keep on going, so that you can never look back and see. Oh, that level's gone. <laughs> yeah, I remember another thing that came up was this idea that uh, when you're doing these level designs, or I guess just design mm -hmm. in, in general, there was little to go on. At NWC, maybe yes. a couple of lines, and you know how unusual was that? Would... Um, it. Uh, I take it you liked it that way. Um, I liked it that way too. It. It. I mean, as a as a level designer, you know, all I got for on Might Magic Six and and Seven was was the the dungeon name, and then like a, a sentence or two description of of like. So the quest is to go to. Uh, Whatever's caverns and and get get a MacGuffin, whatever, a little trinket, something. And you're like, okay, well, uh, what's that look like? They don't know. I don't know. I you know so. And in a couple of those, in a couple of those uh, levels, um, I don't remember which ones now, but but I ended up completely redesigning the quest, <laughs> and I hadn't meant to. I just, uh, I just, uh, you know, I was like, during the course of the level design, the the level had. I was like, oh well, let's add this little element and this other thing, and 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 then I'd showed it to uh, who was that? Paul. I showed it to Paul, who was the writer and designer on Mike Magic Six, and and he was like, oh, he liked it, and he. Rewrote the whole quest, and I didn't ask him to. I think he renamed the dungeon after my little, little write-up wow. thing that I've done too. And I, was like, oh, I didn't didn't expect you to do that, Paul. But <laughs> I guess in modern parlance, they would talk about it, that being an organic process of. Uh... Yes, yes, <laughs> and and these days I think you'd probably call that um, uh, the non-waterfall development method, like the Scrum method. Yeah. You know, get it up and running, and then iterate. Uh, you know, but it's funny because when I when I started Might and Magic Nine, I was like, you know what? I'm going to change this. I'm going to write huge level design documents on on all of these different levels in the game, so that when I give it to the level designer, they know what to build. And that level design document was huge. <laughs> you think it was a good move to go that way? It, you know, it's it's a good question, and I think you'd have to ask the level designers if. If they thought that was a good move, because the, the the work that they gave me, I thought was great. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not they thought I was kind of being a tyrant, <laughs> a design tyrant or not, is is another story. Uh, but when I was at EA, they 
their approach was very, very much the same. Um, they came up with, they'd had these things called, uh, they called them beats, which were little highlights of the levels. Yeah. And at least on uh, Rising Sun, so the, the console Medal of Honor, they had little, little basically it was like a, a flow chart of little squares, and they said, this happens, and then this happens, and this happens. And they'd hand that to the level designer, and then you'd have to go and create that into a level. Um, on the console game, Pacific Assault, it was very, very well spelled out of what the level was supposed to look like. And, and very, very much like what I had done on Might and Magic 9 rather than, than uh, somewhere in between, which I think, I think Medal of Honor or the Rising Sun, the console one, had the perfect sight. Okay, as long as you hit this beat, this beat, this beat, this beat, and this beat, level can be whatever you want. That seemed like a fair compromise. Yeah, yeah, and and that way, like, I mean, it all depends on the creativity of the level designer. If if they're really into the being creative, and you know, you want to give those guys a latitude. If if they're more like like the the very structured and and you know they're good, but tell me what you want kind of guys, then you want those guys. You want to you want to you want to give them. Basically, you want to give give the designer, and this goes for all all developers. Give them what they need to do their job. And I was, that's one thing I was told uh, uh, level designers and people who, who worked under me was you have to speak to the, the artist or the programmer or the, or the producer or the, whoever you're talking to about your vision of, of the game or whatever you were. You have to tell them in their language. You know, so, so like a programmer, when you're describing programming mechanics, most of the time that programmers doesn't want all the flowery language or anything like that. They want, they want this happens, then this happens, then this happens. If this, this other thing happens, then do this other thing. They want very structured, very strict, organized bullet points. An artist, what are they going to do with bullet points? You know, they're the ones that kind of more want that flowery speech and, and, you know, cause it inspires their, their, uh, inner eye and their creativity. Um, and then the, uh, the producers and people above that, they usually just want, you know, like they just want a big tome. One, when I was at, at Spin Master, it's, it's kind of a, an interesting uh, uh, story. Um, one day, the the VP comes up to me and says, "So I've got a meeting with with uh, the president of the company, and they want to see the game design document." And we really didn't have a game design document. <laughs> we had looking we basically. At well, basically, what we had was we kept all the design in uh, a Wikipedia page, so it was all—I mean, not Wikipedia, but it was a wiki page. A wiki, yeah. Yeah, and and I was like, well, <laughs> you know, there's not—it's not a GDD. You just you go and you find the heading, and you go and he's like, well, they want a GDD for this meeting. So I printed out the entire wiki page. <laughs> and I put it on his desk. It was like like you know, took a ream of paper. Bam! There you go, John. <laughs> And he's like, "Oh, this is perfect." He took it to them, and they were done. I don't, I don't think they ever read it, but they were happy to have had. Yeah, I wonder if part of that is just look how big this is. You know, clearly yeah. these guys know what they're doing. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I was wondering if uh, part of this, you know, flexibility, I guess, that you you were given back then, was had anything to do with this shift from into the three D engine and the, like, maybe people just didn't really know what they wanted out of this, you know, moving from uh, Might and Magic 5 uh-huh. to 6, you know, there must have been a lot of yeah. uncertainty. Um, that's a good question. And, and I don't, I'm not sure if I know the answer to, to that specifically, like, um, cause we, that wasn't something that we really thought about at the time. I'm, but at the time it was also like, me and the guys that were hired with me as level designers were the first level designers that New World had ever hired. Wow. So New World before us was was very very small teams of a you know maybe a dozen guys. Um, there would have been like John would have been in charge of the project. There would have been a lead programmer, uh, a lead artist, and then a designer. And then everybody else in the company, including the office manager, uh, kicked in as testers and designers and and things like that. So if you look at the original uh, Heroes One, 
But that list of level designers or, or designers or whatever in the credits, those are all people who did other jobs. So one guy in particular, uh, his name was Ben. Ben Bent. He was the office manager, and his job was to, to make sure the office ran smoothly. But he he did level design on on basically every game that New World had produced up until that point. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and he actually went on to become a, a, a direct a director or a producer. He he moved up and, and became more than just the office manager. I'm waiting to hear you say that, you know, the, we, the janitor, you know, was... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't remember the janitors at New World. I, they, they had to have been there. Right? <laughs> But uh, I don't remember them going through. But if they, if the janitor knew how to use a computer, or we let them, then they would have. I think our receptionist designed levels. <laughs> so probably some of my favorite levels. <laughs> yeah, it could could have been. Um, yes, yes, Lars wanted to know that. By the way, uh, what are the what are your favorite levels that you've designed? Oh man, so I was kind of just thinking of opening that up to all all the games you've worked on. You know, do you have a that's. That's a really good question, and 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 I wish I would have thought about this beforehand. If you really wanted to show, like, this is what I can do, you the know, one, you know, one that I was always very proud of, just in terms of of crossing crossing between the the artistry of of level design in terms of game mechanics and the visual mechanics, the visual visualizations was. Um, I was very fond of Lindisfarne Monastery, mm-hmm. um, and also of there's there's a room in Might Magic Seven in the Player's Castle. There was a room that it was too bad that it was just it wasn't really there wasn't a lot of gameplay in there, but there was a room that was like a chapel, and and it was the first time that I had done a a groined vault, which is you know like there's there's barrel vaults which are basically just a semicircle and then a groin vault would be the intersection of two barrel vaults so it's it goes this way and it goes this way and you see it a lot in churches and it was it was really hard to do in in the the mcat editor that that the might magic engine used and and i remember just being so proud of myself for having to do it and i'm sure if i went back now and looked at it i'd think it looked like crap <laughs> but uh you know that was one of the challenges that I always tried, at least personally, I tried to drive uh, as a level designer was to move away from kind of the very simplistic square square rooms and square hallways into stuff that be- looked a little more interesting and, and realistic. And and that was, for the time of Mind Magic 7, that was definitely the pinnacle of it of it (laughs) um one other thing that that uh that i really really liked and i can't remember the name of the dungeon and (laughs) and that's probably really bad but you know i've I've done hundreds i there's there's one dungeon in might magic six and and it starts in a, a lava chamber it's in it's in the first town but you come back to it later uh so it's in new sorpagal but it's and it's it starts in a big lava chamber you walk around the outside and then you go off and and do your thing. And in in there, there's this puzzle. Uh, it's it's a bridge puzzle. And you, there's levers on different sides of the bridges. And you pull the levers, and the bridges move in different orders. And and the idea is to pull the levers in the right order so that the two bridges align correctly, and you walk across. And and uh, I was reading after the game came out. I was reading about. I was on somebody's somebody's. Uh, forum page or something reading about the people talking about the game and and somebody had posted i'm having such a huge problem with this puzzle and when i read that i'm like oh man that's the last thing a level designer wants to do is design a puzzle that nobody can solve i mean it's fine to make them hard but if they you know if it's a puzzle so frustrating people quit that's no fun but uh some guy posted right after and he's like i i just did this and this and this and i don't remember what he said but it was something that that I had not even considered, and and the idea that that not just that he could outthink me or or break the puzzle or whatever, but just the the idea that this puzzle that I created had uh, 
more than one creative solution that I hadn't thought about that just kind of spontaneously came about. I was so excited about that. And, you know, the puzzle took me maybe, you know, two days to make or whatever. But and, and but this whole creativity of of people, of of the players to, to think outside the box. I was like very happy, very excited about that. That's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, I should be back next week. Probably have two, maybe three more parts of my interview with Mr. Lang. And then I'm thinking about doing a couple of reviews uh, to make up. I know it's been a while since I've done some of those. And uh, we've got a lot of great people uh, that have agreed to come on the show. Uh, so I'm still lining up uh, those interviews. So anyway, there's lots of great stuff to look forward to. So hope you stay uh, stay tuned. And as always, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for your support of this show. Really, truly uh, means a lot to me. You're keeping these episodes coming. Uh, as you know, I kind of hit a bit of a slump uh, uh, last few weeks, uh, maybe even last few months, and uh, really started to turn that around last week. Got some uh, new people, I'll mention them uh, here in a minute, who've uh, really stepped up to the plate. So really just uh, super appreciate that, guys. Uh, thank you. You are completely awesome. Uh, if uh, you haven't supported the show yet, just go over to the uh, mattchat.us or you can uh, go to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site. It only takes a couple of minutes and uh, you'll feel a lot better, I think, and you'll like the show a lot more because you will be uh, basically producing it yourself. So uh, thank you very much for your support. Really appreciate it. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? <laughs> Alright, uh, first bit of news, uh, we are doing a Google Air Hangout, this will be May 26th at uh, 6 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. I know some of you have done those already. Uh, anybody can watch. Uh, if you're a Patreon supporter though, you can actually be part of the broadcast. Uh, just send me your info, your email, or th that you'd like to do that and I can uh, I'll send you an invitation for that. We always have a good time with these and sometimes I'll even have special guests from previous episodes. So uh, check that out. Uh, also, uh, this isn't quite news at this point, but I did want to mention this game, uh, Expeditions Viking. Uh, this is uh, from Logic Artists. They're the same guys that did the Expedition uh, Conquistador a while back. Uh, personally, I think this is a much uh, more fun setting here with the Vikings. I mean, how can you go wrong with Vikings? Uh, it's a lot of fun. It kind of reminds me of uh, the Baldur's Gate style, uh, 90s uh, style, uh, but this one has a really intense turn-based combat. It's actually quite challenging. Having a, a great time with it, uh, so I definitely wanted to mention that. Uh, maybe I'll do a review of it too, uh, we'll see. Uh, another game I've been playing quite a bit is called Hearthlands. Uh, this came out uh, late last month, it's from Sergio or Sergio and Simon. And uh, this one is kind of like Settlers, if you remember that, did a review of that way back in the day. Uh, or the Caesar series, you might remember that. Uh, I think that was, uh, was that DOS or uh, Windows? Uh, anyways, early sort of... Uh, uh, real-time strategy games. Uh, these are a lot of fun and uh, this one I think really fits into that genre well. Really I wouldn't seem out of place on the Amiga uh, if you uh, <laughs> to be honest with you. And I don't think that's a bad thing at all. Uh, so if you're kind of nostalgic for that style of game go check out Hearthlands. That's on Steam. And then uh, Stig wrote in about this. Apparently uh, Bioware Montreal is scaling down. They're putting their Mass Effect series on hold. And as far as I can tell, it's because the, the latest one, Andromeda, uh, didn't do so well. It just did okay. Uh, whatever. I guess it only made a few million. A few million, I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, there's a lot of... Uh, people are reporting, anyway, a lot of technical issues with it and other kinds of complaints. Now, personally, I played the game on my Xbox One. Played it all the way through. I didn't have any of these uh, technical issues they're complaining about. As a matter of fact, I... I just really liked it, but I guess my standards are a lot lower than some of these uh, these folks uh, these days. But but anyway, for what it's worth, I had a good time with it. Uh, don't be dissuaded uh, by all the negative reviews. I, I think if uh, if you have an Xbox, at least, uh, you shouldn't have the, the problems. At least I didn't. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, what about that ale of the week? Uh, well, this week I've got something really special. This is the um, White Oak... 
It's a 50% wheat wine style ale, aged in bourbon barrels, 50% uh, ale. So it's 50% wheat wine style ale and 50% uh, bourbon barrel ale. It's a quote unquote hearty blended wheat wine style ale with a canopy of caramelesque, vanilla ish, and oak like flavors. Oh, and it contains alcohol. <laughs> Well, let's see, Famille Rue, Family Rue, Famille Rue, Okie Dokie, let's see where these guys out of, brewed and bottled by the brewery at Placentia, California, Placentia, huh, uh, a little bit more there, uh, crisp effervescence spirals around sweet bourbon barrel aged layers, <laughs> you know, you almost have to be a poet to work at a, a brewery these days, huh? Uh, anyway, I loved the, uh, I'm really intrigued by this idea of a wheat wine married to a bourbon barrel. Uh, that sounds fantastic. Uh, anyway, let's see, is there anything else there? Oh, uh, oh, alcohol 12.5% by volume. So this will definitely be on the stronger side. <laughs> I probably won't be drinking this a whole bottle. Yeah, right. Uh, anyway, let's get this thing open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this uh, brewery white oak wheat wine style bourbon barrel concoction here in the rather excellent drinking horn. Ah, you definitely smell the bourbon in this. A little bit of a kind of a cherry aroma. Kind of, you know, it's it smells like a Jack Daniels. You know, if you, I'm sure you're familiar with that. Anyway, it just smells really, really good. It's not overpowering. It doesn't have the sort of fumes, uh, I guess, that Jack Daniels would. You know, that really strong sort of uh, an alcohol that gets into your nose. And you don't have that here. You know, I could smell some of that caramel they were talking about, too. Uh, anyway, it smells really good. Now, before I drink this, I wanted to uh, make a toast here. A little shout out to the new rats here in the Matt Cave. We've got Alexander, DP, Bjorn, Adam, Philip, and Ed. And also two new executive producers, James Mays and Saxon Bell. So uh, here's to you guys. I really appreciate your help. Anyway, <laughs> uh, let's give this a white oak a try. Ooh, man, that is a... <coughs> Ooh, uh, that'll get your attention. You definitely taste a strong bourbon. Uh, flavored it. This kind of overpowers everything else, at least at first. Uh, a little bit of kind of a peachy flavor, I would say. I guess that must be the wheat uh, wine kicking in there. Uh, but it really tastes more like a sort of caramelly uh, bourbon to me. Uh, I'll try it again here. Yes, it's a. <laughs> it's really smoky. It's kind of a oh, grape flavor. There's just a lot of different flavors going on here. I'll tell you what, though, man, you would not want to chug this. I like taking the tiny sips, and it's almost overpowering. Now, let me try it one more time here. Ooh, man. Damn. Damn. <laughs> I tell you, you don't want to play around with this thing. Oh, wow, white oak. Uh, well, I'll say it's a very, very strong uh, flavor-wise. I am tasting some alcohol in here. A lot of us smoky flavors, uh, the bourbon is very pronounced. Uh, a little bit of that wheat wine maybe on the, the back end there. Uh, but really what you're tasting is that bourbon, that sort of smoky bourbon cherry-like flavor to it. You know, I'll try it one more time here. <laughs> Whew. That is just really, really strong. Uh, I guess if you if you like uh, strong ales like I do, uh, you'd probably want to try this one. <laughs> if uh, uh, if you don't like that though, you probably want to steer very clear of this one because it really packs a pretty mean punch. Uh, I'm gonna go a full five out of five drinking horns on it though, because uh, I really like that it uh, you know it is what it advertises itself to be: <laughs> wheat wine meets bourbon. I mean that's exactly what I taste here, and they uh, did a lot of uh, it's just packing a lot of flavor. You definitely want to take your time with it, uh, but other than that, I think it's great. So, a uh, full five out of five for the white oak. All right, let's try to wrap this up before the white oak kicks in. Uh, I've got a quotation here, uh, and I was looking for quotes about architecture because I was thinking that that sort of is kind of like level design, right? Seems uh, related somehow. Uh, but anyway, I came across this quotation by uh, the British poet Samuel Butler. It really seems to fit. So, 
uh, let me know what you think. It goes something like this. Every man's work, whether it be literature or music or pictures or architecture or anything else, is always a portrait of himself. See you guys next week. Yes.